Uh, Caroline is an architect, professor, and author based in London. Uh, after her award-winning book called Hungry Cities, she recently published Seatopia, How Food Can Change the World. And we all know for sure that the world needs some change at the moment. So Caroline has been dedicating her work in trying to understand how food shapes our lives on a global level. So we asked Caroline to give us her general insights on how food can change the world, especially during a pandemic, even though, of course, the challenges that our cities face regarding food go way beyond the current crisis. So I will leave the floor to Carolyn, who will give us her insights about um, this topic. So Caroline, thanks again very much for being with us, for being with, the, with Diddy's crowd. And I will leave the floor to you. Thank you very much indeed, Camille. Um, it's great to be here. And as you rightly say, uh, there's many, many interesting parallels between the kinds of things, questions that I was looking at before COVID struck um, and, and, you know, obviously what's, what's now occurring, what we're dealing with, with, with the pandemic. So um, I will try to explain, I'll start my timer and I will try to explain in 40 minutes, um, basically how food shapes our lives. So, I mean, every, all of you are in the food industry, so you're very aware of course, that food shapes shapes elements of our world. But actually, I think, you know, it's very interesting when you see the complete picture um, and realize that it actually can be a sort of communicative tool to, to, to address all the problems we face in a connected way. Um, this is me uh, receiving the book, the first copy of the book. Um, and I'm just going to stick. Camille over there. Um, and yes, the book is called Cytopia. Cytopia is a, a word that I invented. It means food place. Um, and it comes from the Greek sitos for food and topos for place. And I'll explain a bit more about how I came to invent this world, but essentially, uh, this word I should say, but essentially we live in a Cytopia. We live in a world shaped by food. Um, and really my, my favorite image for discussing this is this wonderful fresco by Ambregio Lorenzetti. I don't know how many of you know it. It actually sits in the town hall in Siena um, in the main council chamber. And so it's about 20 meters wide. Um, and as you can see, interestingly, it's called the allegory of the effects of good government. Um, and I remember sort of seeing this image when I was an architecture student and thinking, well, that's a a wonderful image of Siena in its countryside. But what I didn't really quite think then for reasons that uh, I find very interesting now is that really this image is all about food. Um, and it's all about the crucial relationship at the heart of urban civilization, which is between the city on the one hand and the countryside on the other. Um, and this very dramatic red wall, which sits in the middle of the composition is actually a membrane because you can see that people and food and goods are passing through it the whole time. So you can see, for example, a group of huntsmen leaving the city, maybe to go and shoot a boar. You can see asses with grain on their backs coming into the city, a pig walking into the market. And of course, the, the landscape itself is very artificial. It's been modified to feed the city. And then inside the city, you also see sheep wandering around and a woman with a basket of eggs on her head and so on. Um, and so the allegory of the effects of good government becomes quite obvious. It's actually that the city and the countryside are bound together through food and it's the city's duty, the, the, the duty of the, the city leaders to take care of this relationship because if it's a balanced relationship, then everybody wins. Um, and once you understand the message of this image, I mean, once I understood it, which is probably about 20 years ago now, um, I started thinking, well, why, why did I not see this? You know, why was it not obvious to me that this is actually all about food? Um, and I think it's because food shapes our lives in so, so profoundly and in so many ways that it's actually very difficult for us to see. Uh, and of course, today, most city dwellers don't look out of their window at the landscape that feeds them. It's often thousands of miles away, very denatured, like this one in the Mato Grosso in Brazil. Um, and I call this the urban paradox. And the urban paradox is basically that um, although we think of ourselves as urban and we talk about ourselves as living in cities and so on, because we have to eat, 
uh, we're actually in a sort of, you could say a more profound sense still dwelling in the natural world. And of course we're part of the natural world. Um, and the paradox is that, you know, there's no ideal solution to this because actually as what Aristotle called as, you know, political animals, we're dualistic in our needs. We need both politics, which means society, but also we're animals, which means we need nature. And, you know, the question of how to create the ideal dwelling for a human being, I think is, um, is, is something profound that we've really been struggling with for the last five and a half thousand years, ever since we invented cities and started living in them. Now, until very recently, most people who didn't think about food very much probably would have just assumed that we'd solved the problem of how to feed ourselves. You know, you could walk into any supermarket in the Western world and you could see this kind of scene playing out, just you know, the massive, shall we say, a display of plenty. Um, but of course, as we know, uh, with COVID at the beginning of the year, uh, for the first time, many people saw this very, very shocking sight. This is actually, my local supermarket in London. Um, and I think for many people who weren't thinking about food, this was a, a major wake up call. Um, and I will come on to talk about COVID a bit more later on, but of course, for those of us, and I'm sure all of you listening, uh, this will not have been a, a, a surprise at all because you, you knew as I did that the, we're fed on a just in time uh, system and there's no slack in, no slack in it at all. So there aren't kind of, um, Fast supply stores just down the road that could could withstand a sudden unexpected shock like this. I think we forget living in the modern city the the question of how to eat is our oldest shared question and the one that has done more than any other to shape our lives. Um, and I think this is a wonderful image here of the Hadza in Tanzania, which, which is one of the few groups of people who still live as hunter gatherers. Um, and, you know, really in this image for me, you know, I sort of see the evolution of our species and in the crucial moment in which fire was invented, you know, and fire which allowed us to cook food, which meant our brains expanded because we were able to specialize in hunting and take on calories much more quickly, but also conviviality began. And also the division of labor. So the women staying around the, the camp to cook tubers and to look after the fire and the men going off hunting which you could say is a domestic arrangement that um, in many ways still persists to this day. But also crucially, the evolution of language um, and the, the sort of the evolution of a sort of uh, a way of sharing that was actually seen as equitable. So the shared meal in which every member of the tribe comes back to the camp at the end of the day and the, the spoils really of, the, of everyone's daily efforts are shared out in the form of a, of a meal. I think is both the oldest and still the most profound and flexible and basically transparent uh, economy that humankind's ever invented. Um, and I think we still share through food, but we just don't realize it. Now, of course, how you choose to feed yourself for all animals has a profound effect on the kind of uh, habitats that they can inhabit or create for themselves. Uh, and of course, for most of human history, roughly the first two million years, we were hunter gatherers. I call this living in the larder. You basically kind of follow the food around and you know pluck fruit off trees, not always as faithfully as in this case. Um, but you know, basically you you moved to where the food was, and people might have had a sort of a, a territory that they kind of circulated within. So it was a, a peripatetic existence. Um, and of course, with the co-evolution of farming and cities, and I'm, I'm skipping over thousands of years of very complex evolution here, but we only have 40 minutes. Um, the way of living changes radically. So with the invention of farming, which happens from about 12,000 years ago, um, things look very different. And uh, in the ancient Near East in Mesopotamia, we started to see complex static settlements complex enough to be called uh, cities. And this is one of them, Ur, um, just to sort of where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet. Um, and we can see these first cities, we can see certain sort of very interesting phenomena about them. Uh, the first of which is that they're very small, that's about 500 meters across. They're very dense, that that's a sort of example of what the whole of the city would have been like, a uh, very, very tightly packed residential area. 
they're on a river, which of course provided transport as well as uh, a, a means of irrigating the farmland. And in fact, the very complex drainage systems that sort of evolved around these cities um, were built actually by slave labor effectively are the sort of the first uh, municipal earthworks in the world. Um, and crucially, we also see this large temple complex. Uh, and it's interesting that the temple uh, organized the harvest. So there's a bit of a reversal here. So in a hunter gatherer society, the most important person is the best hunter. <laughs> And uh, he, it's almost always a he, is the natural leader. Um, but in an urban society, the people growing the food are not the people who control the food. The people who control the food are the temple elders, and they organize the harvest, and they evolved writing and accounting in order to sort of work out where all the food was going, gathered in the grain, offered it to the gods in the temple, stored it in the temple granary, cooked it in the temple bakery and then redistributed it round the city in the course of the year. So if we were going to ask the question, how did the first cities in the world feed themselves? We would say they were city states. I often use the call, call this the, the sort of the fried egg urban um, plan where the, the yolk is the city and the white is the countryside um, with in the middle, a large centralized food distribution hub is probably what we'd call that now. Um, and this was an incredibly successful model. It was repeated all over the world. Um, and Aristotle, I, I said earlier, who coined this term political animals and understood this profound relationship between the city and the countryside. He and Plato indeed, his, his teacher, they wondered about the ideal size of a city because they recognized that feeding a city was crucial and that self-sufficiency uh, for the city or the city state, the polis, was critical to its uh, political independence. Um, and they spoke of this concept, oikonomia, uh, which basically means household management from oikos house and uh, neme and actually management. And the idea was that every citizen would have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside and the farm would feed the house. So that's good household management. And then if every citizen had that, then the state itself would be self-sufficient and then when you had enough people or you know, trades like sort of, you know, uh, furniture makers or doctors or lawyers or whoever you needed, then that was the ideal size for the city. And it should grow no bigger because the bigger the city grew, the harder it would get to feed itself. Um, and I find it very interesting that this word you may sort of feel is vaguely familiar. It's because it gives us the basis of our modern word economy. But of course, what we mean by a modern economy is very far from this. In fact, it's precisely what Aristotle warned against, uh, which was the making of money for its own sake. And he said, you can never be happy when money is your goal because there's no such thing as natural balance. Whereas with oikonomia, there is. Now, as I say, most cities in the ancient world follow this model, but famously there was one that bucked the trend. Rome had, uh, a million citizens, it's estimated by the first century AD. So I actually warn Camille about this. I'm going to ask you a question and, and maybe you can type it in the chat. Um, how do you think Rome fed itself? Any, anything coming through Camille? I'm not seeing anything yet. Okay. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Good question. And I'll give... The good question is <laughs> how did Rome feed itself with 1 million, you said, inhabitants? 1 million inhabitants. So it's clearly not the fried egg. It's clearly not the supermarkets. It's not supermarkets. Is it Uber Eats? I'm being asked. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you the answer now because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Fish. Answer. Answers are coming in, but uh... is food miles. Okay, so basically we think of food miles as a modern phenomenon, but they're not. Uh, a city the size of Rome could never have fed itself from its local hinterland because it, it was simply A, there wouldn't have been enough space and B, transporting the food into the city would have just been too difficult and expensive. It was about 50 times cheaper to transport food over water than over land in the ancient world. 
And so it was actually Rome's access to the sea that made it possible for it to sequentially conquer Sicily, Sardinia, Carthage, and then very famously Egypt, uh, where it exported 6,000 farmers and a big military backup. Uh, and Egypt really became the sort of the grain, uh, the breadbasket, if you like, of Rome. And the Alexandrian uh, grain ships uh, were like the super tankers of their day. And of course, it wasn't just grain that Rome was importing, but wine, oil, pork, even fresh oysters from London uh, at the height of the empire. Um, I mean, Rome is completely fascinating, and I could, indeed, I, I sometimes have done entire talks just about how Rome fed itself because it has many echoes for us today. It was the first city to outgrow its local hinterland, um, to rely on imports from a long way away rather than grow its own food, and it was absolutely to do with its size. But of course, its hunger then drove the empire, and ultimately, it got so big that it really, the sort of the internal controls could no longer support such an enormous network and it collapsed and interestingly also the soils of North Africa which had fed it became de uh, very salinated and uh, infertile because all the nutrients were being sucked out but they weren't being put back in again. Um, so geography was vital to the feeding of the city in the pre-industrial world I think is the main takeaway from that. Um, and the first person, I'm sure some of you know this stuff backwards, but just in case some of you don't, uh, Johann von Thunen was the first person to analyze how the productive hinterland of a city would naturally develop. Um, and he wrote a book called The Isolated State in 1826, when he said, imagine uh, a city, which is the pink blob in this diagram, surrounded by a flat, featureless, fertile plain inhabited only by logical profit-seeking farmers. And how would that productive hinterland naturally develop? Um, and he said, well, obviously in the city outskirts, you would have fruit and vegetables because uh, it's difficult to transport fruit and vegetables a long way because they tend to squash and go off. Uh, they're a luxury food and therefore the farmers can afford the high land rents near the city and also they can make very good use of night soil quote unquote which is human and animal manure which was collected and dumped on the land to make it more fertile so you've got a sort of little mini ecosystem going there and then sorry um a sort of band of between 20 and 30 miles of mixed production of of, of firewood for fuel but also grain and grain is the most important food of cities because it could be easily stored and transported and it always has been the key food of cities, uh, even today. Um, but it was very heavy and bulky in relation to its value. So beyond about 30 miles, Von Thunen reckoned it wasn't economic for farmers to bring the food in anymore, the grain, because the, it would double the cost of it. So beyond that, the only economic thing to do was to grow livestock because of course the livestock can provide their own transport into the city. Of course, if the city was on a navigable river, then all of those bands could be a lot further away because the food could be taken to the river and then brought in by, by water, which is much, much cheaper and easier. Um, so that's all rather dry and abstract. It gets much more fun when you start looking at real cities. Um, and this is my home city of London. And you can see, in essence, you know, exactly what von Thunen was describing in a, in a real situation. So all pre-industrial cities were surrounded by market gardens. Um, the grain, if the city was on a river, would almost certainly be coming in mostly by river because it was much cheaper. Um, and you can see the sort of literally the, the way the, the food is flowing through the city. So for example, in London, we have a street called Bread Street that tells you that grain was flowing through on its way up to Cornhill. Corn, of course, Cornhill is where the, the grain, the corn was traded. Um, and in fact, if you look at any city that was founded before the railways, um, you know, you can see these kind of, these food names in the streets. It's kind of quite a fun thing to do if you don't have anything better uh, to get on with under lockdown. Um, just get an old book of maps out and have a look. Um, Fish, of course, was also coming in uh, by river. Billingsgate, some of you probably know, remained London's main fish market until well into the 1980s. Um, fish Street, you can see Friday Street is where you bought your fish on a Friday when the eating of meat was forbidden. But of course, animals are coming in, they're walking in, so it's a totally different picture. Um, most of London's meat was coming from places like Scotland and Wales, where there's a lot of very good grass. 
coming down to a smooth field outside the city, uh, which of course then became Smithfield, which remains London's market today. And actually one of the very interesting things to say about London, uh, about sort of food systems in general is that they have great inertia. Uh, so once they're established, they very rarely move or they, they, they can literally last for centuries. Um, I put free trade at the bottom because London had a navigable river, so it was able from very early on to adopt this business of importing its food as Rome did uh, from a long way away. It was already importing a lot of grain from the Baltic, for example, by the ninth century. Um, and so this gave it a very different approach to feeding itself to example Paris, uh, because the Seine is not navigable by ocean going ships. Um, food was visible in the pre-industrial city. This is again Smithfield, I was just talking about you know, up to 10,000 animals in this space at one time. No, that's before Christmas when the great cull happened because of course in the pre-industrial world, um, most of the herd was slaughtered uh, for the winter. Um, around, of course, if you have animals walking into the city live, you have to kill them in the city. So this creates a lot of chaos, necessary chaos. But there were about 184 unregulated slaughterhouses around Smithfield. A lot of the unwanted offal and so on was thrown into the River Fleet, which was just behind those buildings there, which quickly became a sort of stinking cesspit, really not very nice at all. Um, but, you know, it's fair to say that probably if you lived in the uh, in London in the early 19th century, you you kind of you knew where your food came from because it was mooing and bleating in front of your window. Um, and really, I mean, I've very, very rapidly, but I've already used up half my time, you know, that was the deep, profound relationship between food and cities in the pre-industrial world. Um, and when the railways came along, it all changed radically pretty much overnight, and it's a cliche, um, but actually, you know, railways for the first time allowed food to be transported for long distances rapidly, um, and three key things change at this point. The first is that food having been very visible is now gonna become invisible because instead of cattle walking into market, they start to be slaughtered outside the city and brought in as dead meat. Secondly, politicians who had one way or another been responsible for organizing the food of the city and feeding people uh, when started to put that responsibility over to food companies. And last but not least, of course, cities themselves, which had been constrained in size by geography, could now grow to any size and really any place. So here we see London. You can see in the mid uh, 19th century, it's barely grown bigger than the medieval maps we were just looking at. But very rapidly after the railways come, it becomes this vast metropolitan splurge that you couldn't possibly feed from just one or two little markets in the middle. And of course, at the same time, the productive landscape is being transformed. So this is what happened to the Great West. Uh, basically, in the 10 years after the railways came, a kind of grassland inhabited by Native Americans and about an estimated 60 million bison. Uh, the bison was slaughtered. The Native Americans were sent off to reservations if they were lucky. Um, and basically, not very much was done with the actual meat. But it created this, the world's first grain glut, effectively. And of course, grain, as we, as we know, is the food of cities. Um, and I'm not going to give you a quiz because I think it's too obvious to this audience, but the question of what you do when you've got too much grain to eat, of course, the answer to that is you feed it to animals. Um, so this really is the beginning of the invention of cheap meat. Uh, and of course, again, I don't have to tell this audience that, you know, all sorts of issues arose from this um, way of creating um, food. Um, the animals themselves became sick um, and the meat packers were able to get very, very rich and powerful and to undercut local independent producers. Um, while the land itself, having had this radical transformation affected on it, uh, became unstable. Uh, there were no longer long, long roots of a sort of perennial grassland to keep the soil pinned and moist and uh, basically living. Um, and after a series of disastrously dry years in the 20s and 30s, basically the topsoil blew away in the famous Dust Bowl. 
Um, and this was the beginning of this kind of conversation really that rages today, you know, how do we feed the world, a, a, a formulation I hate, by the way, because, well, we can discuss why, but who's we to begin with. But anyway, um, you know, this kind of uh, dichotomy between the apparent miracle of chemical farming with monocultures and just as Liebich was the German chemist who first identified N, P and K as the essential nutrients to plants. And of course, the Harbour Bosch process, which fixes atmospheric nitrogen. And on the other hand, people like Albert Howard who in the 1940s were arguing powerfully against this already and saying, no, 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 this is crazy. Uh, plant health and our health is all based on a living soil. And it's about mycorrhizal connections and the plant feeding soil fungi sugars and the fungi feeding the plant minerals and this kind of underground market of nutrients, if you like. Um, and actually Howard was winning that argument um, until this happened. Uh, the Second World War, of course, um, it was basically all about maximizing yields now. Uh, and really the balance tipped uh, radically in favor of, of growing with chemicals. And as some of you probably know, uh, that was partly to do with keeping the factories who were making things like uh, munitions and uh, chemical weapons uh, going in case there was another war. Um, so after the war, really that was kind of that conversation was over. We'd solved the food problem. People started driving cars. People began building cities that, you know, I would struggle even to call a city. And of course this is all over prime farmland because the original town would have been put where it could feed itself in the middle of the, the best land. Um, and of course we don't go to a market in the middle of the city anymore, we leave the city to go to a box outside instead, where we wander around in a sort of air conditioned space. Um, and of course food itself is also denatured to withstand these new logistics. Um, and this is the beginning really of our sort of mental and physical distancing from what you might call real food. And of course there are many, many consequences of this, and again I don't have to tell this audience about these, you know it. Uh, food desert. So instead of the city elders feeding people, the food now goes where the money is. So this is a map of New York in which we see, you know, the, all the prevalence of places where you basically you have to walk more than 200 meters to, to get fresh food are Brooklyn and, and uh, Brooklyn down here and also the Bronx and Harlem, the, the poor areas. Um, we see enormous consolidation within the food industry because of course this is the consequence of politicians having really stepped sideways and no longer taking control. Um, and of course, this is probably the most important uh, image of all because it's about the externalities that we've allowed to evolve in this weird creation of this thing that doesn't exist called cheap food. Um, so again, you're, you're professionals in the food industry, I don't have to tell you this, but most people are not aware um, that really many of the threats that we're facing across the planet are to do with this illusion, um, which I believe we need to um, end. Um, and of course, this kind of world, this of processed food and industrial food is going globally because that's where all the money is and that's where all the power is. Um, and it's, as we're now seeing, particularly with COVID, a kind of um, ecological catastrophe as well as a sort of catastrophe for our own health and indeed chances of survival. COVID is really interesting. Um, as Camille said in her introduction, it's sort of, it's raising issues again and it's making things really visible that were kind of visible before if you cared to look sort of thing, but now they're unavoidably visible. The first is obviously that we're in this together and that, you know, the, we're in a global village now and that the way we behave has consequences globally. Um, the second is that this apparent you know, cornucopia that we've created is actually very fragile. Um, this was uh, the 47 or so million Indians who were basically living in cities, but not really living in the city. They were just working there. Their real home is still in, in the villages. And this mass exodus that we saw at the beginning of lockdown, many hundreds of people died on the way. Of course, you know, the zoonotic pandemic indeed itself is to do with our encroachment in wilderness where we, we've never historically been, and also the radical loss of biodiversity in our own habitats that allows it to sort of take hold. Um, huge social inequalities are being exposed. I mean, I just found this picture rather extraordinary of these are all sort of delivery drivers in Bangkok. 
waiting to pick up food for people who can afford to stay at home, if you like. So inequalities, and of course the crisis that we saw also all over the West of Western countries not being able to actually do their own harvest because they usually import cheap labor from somewhere else. In the UK's uh, case, it was Romania. But of course, we're also seeing a positive side um, under lockdown, uh, a huge increase in local neighborliness, people looking after them, each other, people's this discovery that actually having time is at home is a wonderful thing. People, many people in the UK, for example, have been cooking with their kids for the first time, discovering the joys of baking. Um, you know, there's a study done right at the beginning of lockdown and people said they were just amazed, you know, they valued food more, they were cooking more, and only 9% of people said they wanted life to go back the way it was before. And of course, this is raising a huge issue, which is really your, your key issue this today, which is, you know, what's the future of the cities going to be um, if people are going to be working from home? And indeed, what is the future of the countryside going to be? Um, a huge, huge, very, very interesting questions. Um, and of course, it goes back to the question of balance between city and the countryside. Um, other things that have happened under lockdown, of course, is the spontaneous creation of local food networks, because a lot of producers who were supplying restaurants were suddenly out of a market. And this happened very, very rapidly, and it's been extremely successful uh, in several nations, including the UK. Of course, people getting interested in growing their own again. And I think what all of this leads us to is realizing that, you know, we're at the kind of end of a sort of 5,000 year long experiment in living called urbanity. Um, it relies on farming. We kind of forgotten that. Um, and also we've got to, we live, we rely on technologies, many of which you know, we don't really understand. Um, and I love this quote from his British architect called Cedric Price. Uh, he said, you know, probably about 50 years ago now, technology is the answer, but what was the question? Um, and I think this is really interesting. And of course, if you ask yourself that, what is the question? Of course, it hasn't changed. It's the same one. What is a good life? What is a good society? How do we dwell sustainably on whatever landscape we happen to find ourselves on, which in our case, of course, is now planet Earth? Um, and it's really, really interesting, actually, if you begin if, to go back and look at utopian thinkers, they are obsessed, as I was explaining earlier, with this question of what the ideal size of a city should be and what its relationship with the countryside should be. And there's a remarkable consistency actually. So Plato, Thomas More, Ebenezer Howard, they all go for what I call the fried egg, um, the idea of a return to the city state in order to keep the countryside close to the city. Um, and in Ebenezer Howard's case, again, as some of you may know, um, he actually advocated that the land should be owned by the city itself. So he was arguing for progressive land reform and a land value tax that would actually sort of give the city control of the countryside that fed it, which of course would have been literally returned to the condition of the ancient polis, where city and country were part of the one political whole. Um, now, of course, as I uh, sort of, well, probably some of you know, and, uh, you know, it was a shock to me when I discovered it about 15 years ago, of course, utopia is an ideal place, but it's also no place. In other words, it's ideal and therefore can't exist. Um, and it was really this discovery, this rather depressing discovery that led me probably about 15 years ago now to invent this word, Zootopia, because we need to be able to think in a multidisciplinary way about how we live and what a good life is and how we're going to build society and how we're going to inhabit the land. And if utopia can't exist, then we can also do this, ask all of these questions through food, because food shapes our minds, our bodies, our habits, our homes, our cities, our landscapes, our climate, our economy, our politics, everything. So, but we don't tend to sort of see that, but if we learn to see the world through the lens of food, then it becomes an incredibly powerful tool. So as I said, we live in a bad utopia now because we don't value food, which is the stuff from which it's built. And then the question is, well, what would the world look like if we did value food? Um, probably we would stop having landscapes like this. I'm sure most of you know this is a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation, which is lots of animals being fed on grain, which makes them sick, being pumped with antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the, the follow on from a Chicago model. Sorry, that, that, was, my, that was my mouse. Um, or do we have landscapes like the one on the left where cows actually 
they're able to eat grass. And by the way, that's how, why we co-evolve with cows. Again, I know I'm preaching to a very knowledgeable audience here, but you know, um, and creating beautiful landscapes at the same time you might actually want to hang out in. Do we go into the middle of the city as we do on the left to sort of actually see human beings when we buy food or do we leave the city in the name of efficiency or just dial up the curry on our phones? Do we take time to sit around a table? And again, this is what's so interesting about COVID because it's before COVID, um, this was a vanishing habit <laughs> and it's now come back and people are realizing, actually, this is really nice uh, to sort of take time, sit around a table and actually talk with my family, sorry. Um, sorry again. And I'll just leave the mouse alone, I think. And, you know, again, before COVID, this astonishing statistic that 20% of meals eaten in the USA were being eaten in a car. You know, this idea that we were too busy to eat and too busy to cook um, has been really, really interesting under lockdown. I think the great gift of lockdown has been to give us our appreciation of time and living in time back. So, of course, the question of all of these options, if you like, for how to eat, is which one of these actually fits into our idea of a good life. And the point is, we have to turn this on its head. The question is not, how do we feed the world? That's a crazy, I mean, it's this empty question. The question is, what does a good life look like for seven and a half going on nine billion people on a shrinking planet? And when we answer that question, then how can we, you know, basically, how do we feed that, that world through food? So it's a way of thinking that kind of turns the question on its head. Um, one of the, again, I mean, as well as the industrial organic conversation, of course, there's this one. I find this really fascinating. I'm sure many of you have heard of Rob Reinhart, the inventor of Soylent, the kind of the food substitute. Uh, this, I love this quote from him. Worrying about something as simple as food in the digital age is weird. So that's, if you like, encapsulates the te technical, techno-fixed mindset the silver bullet mindset. He calls food simple. And of course, as you all know, it's anything but. In fact, it's the, the, the very reverse. Um, and I put it against this quote from Epicurus, self-sufficiency is freedom. Actually, the idea that as humans, we need to make things in order to be happy. And that can be part of a good life. In fact, it has to be part of a good life. I think, you know, when you're trying to sort of navigate through these apparent dilemmas, what becomes clear is that it's a false polarity. We don't have to have either technology or craft, we can have both. Um, and I think, you know, where it sort of comes home most clearly is when you look at places and times in history when people have really understood the true value of food. And of course, these are all to do with crisis. So this is London in the Second World War, Cuba after the fall of the Soviet Union, Detroit after the cars left. And immediately people went back to growing their own food and food networks grew up because they had to. And of course it's happening again under COVID. But the trick, it seems to me, is to realize that we are in fact in a crisis called climate change and mass extinction. Uh, so actually, this is what we need to do anyway, but just do it without, as it were, a gun to our heads. Um, I think it's very clear that the argument between, if you like, Liebich and Howard is over. I think we have to work with nature. And of course, again, you probably know as much about this as I do, but there's huge numbers, really, really interested and exciting models evolving now. And they've been going for at least 50 years, and of course, 5,000 years, uh, in the case of China, uh, what a permacultural system looks like. Um, but, you know, this is really, really becoming a sort of a big, big trend in agriculture now. I think we need to democratize our food system because currently it's monopolistic and you can't have a democracy with a monopolistic food system. So democratization is really partly about joining the roots to the branches. Uh, and for this, I love Carlo Petrini, the founder of Slow Foods, uh, great uh, phrase, co-producing. Um, the idea that you don't just sort of uh, wait like a passive recipient of your Thai curry at two in the morning, but you actually go out and you understand and meet your food producers and work with them. So ideas like community supported agriculture, food co-ops, uh, of course, we all know about organic box schemes and so on. Um, I think it's very clear that, you know, having dropped the ball with food 200 years ago, we're living in what I call a neo-geographical age. Geography really matters again. And we have to go back to sort of thinking more locally, more seasonally and so on. And this is also something, interestingly, that lockdown has shown us. Um, of course, we can grow food in cities, very important because it's, 
solving that urban paradox of bringing us closer to nature. But of course, you can't feed a city from within itself. So it's also about the city's relationship with its hinterland, bringing food into governance, making space for food. Local infrastructure is really important. This is a family abattoir in upstate New York. Food hubs, going back to the Temple of Ur and actually bringing that back into the city could be a really important way of revitalizing city centers that are now emptying out because people realize they don't have to commute to the office anymore. And again, this idea of you grow what you can grow where you can grow it. It's not a one size fits all idea. Really importantly, it's about bringing back that image I showed you at the beginning, the Lawrence Setti idea of the city and the country living in harmony. And of course, this is an allegory of the effects of good government. This cannot happen without political intervention. The market won't give you this. Uh, so planning matters, taxation matters, access to land matters. Um, and there are many examples, again, of how you bring these things together. So MVRDV's project in Almera, where food production is part of the city growth. Uh, Seapool's continuous productive urban landscapes, bringing the countryside back into cities and re-inhabiting things like old car parks and stuff, interrogating the latent productivity of a city region. I think we need rural reform. I've got 20 seconds left. Um, it's about food sovereignty. It's about rethinking what a landscape for human flourishing might look like. And this is Henry George who gave Ebenezer Howard the idea of land value taxes and of course, regenerative farming. And I think we needed nested governance, so stronger governance, both locally and globally. This is my metaphor for good society, is one in which everyone eats well. It goes back again to our roots. And my proposal is that we reinvest the true value of food in food. So we get take the externalities and put it back in food. And we, that's what I call a utopian economy, which of course is a revolutionary idea. And it requires, if everyone's going to eat well, uh, wealth redistribution, land uh, reform, and different taxation. But this is where I believe we need to go. Because I think if everyone eats well, everything else falls into place. This is the heart of a good society and a good life. So it's about seeing through food, seeing the world through food, and using food as a connective, multidisciplinary, profoundly powerful tool, not only for shaping the world and rebalancing our relationship with nature, but also bringing, reminding ourselves of our greatest short source of joy and pleasure and the need for necessity, uh, the need for necessity, uh, that's not a tautology, the need to make stuff and to be in contact with what it takes to sustain us that bound us together uh, originally as a species. And uh, if you want to know more, there's a lot more in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's no virtual applause, but uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. You have so much, so much content that I know it's hard for you to rush into uh, <laughs> 45 minutes. So thank you for um, for for making it uh, this way. So uh, there was a bit of discussion over the chat, and a few questions came out. Um, so if every one of you agrees, I will be bringing in your questions to Carolyn to be uh, time efficient. The first one came from Alberto, Alberto from Lisbon. He was actually uh, looking at your scheme from Rome and he wonders where the fish came for the Romans in the, um, in the first food trail that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, actually the fish, the fish um, symbols that I had were actually for liquamen, which was this fermented fish sauce that was a bit like, you know, modern Vietnamese nam pla or something like that. So of course the Romans just, they fished the Mediterranean <laughs> um, mostly, but so those little fishy, fishy symbols were actually for liquamen, which was a, 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 Romans loved really rich food. So, um, and again, it, it was sort of, it was created by laying the fish out and letting it rot in the sun. So the best liquamen came from places like Southern Spain and so on. So that's what that was. Okay. Um, thank you. The next question comes from Olivier from Brussels. Do you agree with the fact that we're in a period where food has never been as good and as bad at the same time? And this is where there was a bit of discussion in the chat. Yeah. Um, your view on this? Are we in the good or are we in the bad or are we a bit of both? I think that's a totally brilliant formulation and I kind of wish I'd made it myself. It's absolutely, it sums up where we are. 
so of course you know I mean I I grew up in London you know the 1960s and 70s and it was kind of a virtual food desert I mean you know there was very little good food around I mean there's a very famous food writer in um in the UK called Derek Cooper who wrote a book called The Bad Food Guide <laughs> literally just talking about how dreadful the food was so um, it's certainly true that you can get a, access to a lot better food in London today. And I think, you know, there's been a massive, massive, um, I mean, you know, the Green Revolution, for example, sums this up. You know, the Green Revolution was a miracle on the one hand and a disaster on the other hand, because it massively increased yields, but at the same time, it reduced soil uh, fertility and it, it sort of denuded water resources and it put a lot of farmers in debt. And, and many of them have now committed suicide in the Punjab where it took place. And of course, we now know that, you know, for the first time in history, we have the ability to be overweight and undernourished at the same time, you know, which is just astonishing that we've got to this point. So I think it's a, a brilliant uh, analysis. Um, I think, you know, it, it also talks about the inequality in many of our industrial societies where there's a sort of small group of people who can afford to be interested in food and they, they're making their own sourdough and they're buying all their kind of artisanal cheese and everything. And of course, the vast majority are just eating fast food and ready meals and crisps. So it sort of, you know, it also speaks of the social inequality that I think is at the heart of one of our most urgent issues as, as, a, as the human race, if you like, going forward. Um, and that's really, it also goes to the heart of why I think sort of making it our goal that everyone in society should eat well, so fundamental, because eating well, of course, does not involve eating fast food or not every day. Um, but if you internalize the true cost of fast food, it would actually become impossibly expensive, uh, which is the idea, you know. I, it, it, what price do you put on uh, de deforestation in the Amazon? You know, I mean, it's, it, it's beyond price. I mean, in fact, I was listening, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop talking in a minute. <laughs> I might stop talking now. I was just going to say one thing, you know, I was listening on the radio yesterday. There's this kind of, they discovered water on the moon. <laughs> I mean, wow, you know, apparently 100% less water than is in the Sahara Desert. But nevertheless, we're really excited by this because it means we could live on the moon. I mean, FFS, sorry. You know, if we spent the amount of money that we're spending trying to have a livable station on the moon and just paid it to Brazil, and said, stop bloody well cutting the Amazon down. Wouldn't that be better? Hello, sorry. Anyway, um, I digress. But no, I think it's a brilliant formulation. Is that yours, Olivier? Or is that something you picked up somewhere else? Mm, I don't know uh, if it's um, just something uh, I felt mentioning. Yeah. yeah, I think it's perfect. Yeah, I really agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. Since you're talking about the cost of um, fast food and uh, and how how much really does a, a burger cost? Mm. I think we could transition to the next question from Felipe in Tucson. How do you balance food with economy? For yeah. a financially struggling family, it is easier and cheaper to buy a one dollar McDonald's burger than to buy locally produced food. Yeah, yeah. Say, because the one dollar does not include the uh, social and environmental cost of this burger. Exactly. So, so that's absolutely right. So we've created a world in which precisely this weird scenario exists, as you say, that this very, very destructive, borderline evil, you could almost say food because of its external effects that are just literally raping landscapes and making us sick, is cheaper than a carrot that you've just grown down the road. You know, so we have created this so we've created this really weird i mean you know whenever i read about relativity you know it, at that point when they start talking about the, the sort of the folded plastic sheet where you just start <laughs> losing the plot it is a bit like that we've created this very distorted economic landscape by ex by choosing what costs we're going to externalize so we don't penalize you know burger producers for using soy to feed their animals that happens to come from recently a demolished rainforest, but we should, you know, and in fact, it's very interesting. I, I, I absolutely detest the current UK government because, well, let's not even go there. But to my astonishment recently, they said they're gonna introduce a new rule 
that basically says the the any supplier of food to the UK has to demonstrate transparently that deforestation of rainforest is not involved, which just, and I nearly fell over backwards because my government doesn't normally do things like this. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that's needed. We, we absolutely need to, you know, polluter to pay, deforester to pay, you know, people, farmers who let their chemical runoff go into rivers and, and you know, cause eutrophication and algae blooms should pay. You know, we have to get the, and globally, this is why I talk briefly, far too briefly, about the need for, for global governance here, because we have to start to see the world as our commons and to, you know, and to, to behave in that way. And as I say, I mean, if, if we just got together and said, look, we're not going to go to the moon, it's a totally ridiculous idea. Um, let's just pay Brazil not to cut down any more Amazon. You know, that to me just seems like such a no-brainerish way to go. Um, but yes, we need a different economy, and I call it the Sotopian economy, and you achieve it uh, by internalizing the tr true cost of food production, which means that organic, artisanal, seasonal, local food suddenly becomes a real bargain, because it actually is. It's the only food we can afford to be eating going forward. Okay, the next question slash comment would come from me. Uh, I thought what was very interesting in your presentation is actually the structure of your presentation. You spend a lot of time on the pre-industrial area as if there was some sort of nostalgia of what it happens then. And then there was the post-industrial area where we feel that you, you, you know, you're not that comfortable. And now we're in a COVID and post-COVID world where you explain some of the positive aspects. Um, do you think the post-COVID world can kind of go back to yeah. what was happening in the pre-industrial world? Yeah. Is there any I way we can go back and is there any way we can see this positive aspect from the crisis we are living in right now? Yes, I do. And by the way, I, I would not want to live in the 16th century, so I'm not that nostalgic. <laughs> but I mean, I think what's really interesting, as I said, you know, there's a moment when the railways came that we said, wave goodbye to geography. And now 200 years later, where geography really matters again. So I say we're living in a neo-geographical age. And that means if geography matters again, all the models of how people thought about feeding the city for the last, you know, the previous kind of 5,000 years get really, really interesting again, because all the good ideas are already there. They talked about creating local ecological cycles. They, they conserved nutrients. They, they, they fed the city from as, as, you know, as nearby as possible. And in fact, that was why Rome was so shocking, even to Romans, you know, who used to say things like, well, Rome used to grow all its own grain, but now, you know, and it, it sort of imported roses from Egypt. And now all we grow is roses and we import grain from Egypt. You know, and they saw that as a sign of moral decay. Um, so I think, you know, it, there's so much we can learn from the way people lived in balance with their natural environments before industrialization. So it's not that I'm nostalgic to go back there, no. Um, and I don't particularly want to live in a city that smells of manure, but I, I do think all, all the kind of clues to the kinds of things we need to do are there, plus the elements of a good life, the stuff that make us happy, as I say, making stuff, having contact with nature, having time that we've jettisoned in the sort of industrialist capitalist idea of a good life, lo and behold, they're the things that make us happy. So I think absolutely with COVID and lockdown, not that you would have chosen to go there and it's for the wrong reasons, but actually there are many, many clues as to how we, we, we could create uh, what I call a landscape for human flourishing. Um, which is you, you, you rethink the relationship between the city and the countryside, which we're going to be forced to do now anyway. And in a way, you slightly bring the city to the countryside and the countryside to the city, which is exactly what Patrick Geddes was talking about in, in the star-shaped image that I didn't have time to talk about with you because I was running short of time. But, um, you know, so in a way, the internet is doing that. The internet is bringing the city to the countryside. Historically, the downside of living in the country was that you 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 were out of touch you know you didn't know what was going on that's not the case anymore so this could be revolutionary but also if cities are now going to not going to be full of mad hamsters kind of going into office blocks to earn their millions of pounds 
The question of what a city is going to be for going forward is really interesting. And then again, historical models are really interesting. All historical cities evolved around trade and the principal thing being traded was food. Mm -hmm. So again, I think there are just so many, it's such a rich territory for us to mine and learn from in our past. Yeah. So I think this answers uh, Ruth's question. Uh, it was, isn't it a benefit that COVID makes the flaws in the system visible? And I think you answered uh, that one perfectly. Yes. We have one last question um, as we are running out of time, but we're running out of questions as well. Uh, another question from Olivier. Historically, mealtime and its preparation has always been an important social bond within a community or a family. Today, has this bond not weakened within the family circle? to move outwards in our social lives with friends? So what is the relationship between indoor family and outdoor social bonds? Yeah, I mean, this is so, so, so important. I mean, I don't know whether any of you have seen this amazing film on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. I mean, I really, I really uh, advise it. I think it's essential viewing, but I recommend that you have a strong drink next to you because it's unbelievably uh, worrying and, and frightening in terms of, I think we're all aware of how social media is kind of actually destroying elements of society and our ability to concentrate and, and indeed democracy at certain levels. And this really, this terrifying film spells it out. And I've actually been saying to people, it is as important um, as David Attenborough's recent film, you know, about a life on the planet, you know, where he talks very movingly about um, climate change and, and mass extinction. They're linked together because they're both to do with our, as you say, Olivier, our lack of presence and our lack of awareness of our place in the world. So I think, you know, with industrialization was the beginning of our inability to really perceive where we lived you know, because the food was coming in from somewhere, we didn't see it, you know, we could travel fast on trains, you know, it sort of, it began to detach us from time, as you rightly say, and from place, as you rightly say. And of course, the smartphone now does that to the power of a billion. And of course, it's wonderful that we're all talking on Zoom and I'm not anti-technology at all, but I do think that we need a deep, deep, deep counterbalance to the addictiveness of the smartphone and the manipulativeness of social media and all the fake news that you find on there. And I think, you know, get, we need contact with the real and with time, and, and there's no better way to do that than through food. So I do actually present food in my book as a kind of counterbalance to social media uh, and to the sort of the fleetingness and the nothingness and the meaninglessness of the internet at its worst. Thank you very much. I think that will be the word of the end as we're at the end of our 60 minutes session. Thank you very, very much, Carolyn, for your insights, for your perspective, going back in time to understand a bit better where we are today. I think it's essential and even more as we're trying to prepare a better tomorrow. Um, all of the cities from around the world are at this crossing point. Um, mm. We have been for a few years and now that the system is almost collapsing it's the responsibility to choose which direction we want to take exactly so I think historical perspective was extremely interesting to understand where we come from great pleasure thanks for having me